Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. When you think of prayer, what do you think of? Do you think of something you should do more but don't? Do you think of something you never seem to do enough or right? In short, do you feel guilty about prayer? The Lord says to call upon Him in the day of trouble, and He will deliver us. But so often, life seems to get in the way. There's so much to do, and prayer doesn't get done. Family concerns or friends come in front of prayer. Hours a day are spent on tasks probably that aren't that important. We may not pray because we put it at the bottom of the list. We put it off for many reasons. We tend to put it off when we feel we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to say it or what to say. But prayer is taking God's word, what he has promised to give us, and speaking it back to him. Before each petition of the Lord's prayer is a prayer, it is a promise. No father tells a child to ask for things if they don't aim to give them. Would your heavenly father do that? He would not. If he wouldn't give it, he wouldn't have told you to ask for it. Call upon me, he says, in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. God aims to give you certainty in what to pray for. The goal, though, is not to go home today feeling guilty about prayer, saying with a wounded conscience, I should pray more. Too many sermons about prayer have their goal to get you to pray more. The goal instead is Christ. Don't look to yourself. You'll never find enough prayer in your heart. You'll always come up short. Look first to Christ and find in Him your salvation. Find in Him your forgiveness for not praying enough. Find in Him your salvation and that He did what you did not do. Find in Him the one who lives to intercede at God's right hand for you even now. Find in Him the one who prays for those who never pray for themselves, who places our silent groans and sighs too deep for words before the Father. Find in Him the one who prays for you and loves you even in your sin. Find in Him the one who prayed day and night and when sought in the morning by His disciples was found to be praying. Find in Him the one who prayed long after the disciples went to sleep, even though He was tired from a days of work and answering people's needs. Find in the one Him who prayed for the disciples when they were out in the boat. He standing on the shore and seeing them in the midst of their distress. Find in him the one who prayed before he broke the bread and gave it to the disciples so that they, with their hands, could feed the thousands, the multitudes, with the five loaves and the two fish. Find in him the one who prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17 for you and all believers, that they might be one in him, even as he and the Father are one. Find in him the one who taught his disciples how to pray, gave them the very words to say in the Lord's Prayer. Find in him the one who prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and sweat even drops of blood, praying as he did for your salvation. Find in him the one who prayed even while the others were asleep, even when he told them to watch and pray. Find in him the one who prayed for us even on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Find in him the one whose prayers were heard and are heard and answered before our Father who is in heaven. In short, find in Jesus your forgiveness for not praying, for not calling upon the Lord in your trouble. May this day be not one where you are chastised about prayer or go home feeling guilty about prayer, but a day when you see in Christ the one who did it for you, who prays that you may have all things. For today is Rogate Sunday. The word Rogate comes from a phrase in the Gospel. Jesus says, pray ye. In Latin, the language that the Gospel was read in for many years, that word is Rogate. It is Ask Sunday, a day focused on prayer. Jesus was going to the Father. He was ascending into heaven. He would not be with them any longer in the same way. The conversation would continue just on a different front. They could speak to the Father, and the Father would hear them. 
He would hear them an account of Christ and what Christ did for them. They would still have the ability to communicate. I do not say to you, Jesus says, that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me. You have believed that I came forth from God. Through Jesus' death and the cross, we have access to God, and God loves us as his dearly loved children. It is why we pray in Jesus' name. It is why at Jesus' baptism, the heavens were opened and the Spirit came down so that our prayers could go up. It is why at Jesus' death, the curtain separating the Holy of Holies was torn in two, that now through Christ, you can go through to heaven in your prayers. It is why Jesus ascended and was received into heaven, that in his risen body, your prayers approach the Father's throne of grace and come before him. Through Christ, you are God's beloved children. Jesus became our brother so that God could become our Father. In ancient times, the days of this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, right before the ascension of our Lord into heaven, were marked by special prayers. The pastor would lead processions from the church into the surrounding countryside, into the fields, to ask for special blessing on the crops. Through the cross, we can ask God for many things. These customs started some 1,500 years ago. They were called the rogation days, the days of asking. In the Old Testament lesson for today, we see that the hearts of the children of Israel had given way to unbelief and despair as they made their way through the wilderness to the promised land. After 37 years, they were tired. The people, they asked to let them travel on the road so they could travel the straight and easy way to Canaan denied their request. They had to backtrack and go on a much more difficult path and journey. 37 years and they were going nowhere but backwards seems like our lives. They spoke against God and Moses. You have brought us here to this moment because you have brought us here to die. We're never going to get to where you have promised to bring us. Your promises are not trustworthy nor true. God sent poisonous serpents among them. They had been bitten by the poison of Satan's lies, believing those lies instead of God's word. But strangely enough, they cried to Moses, something unlike what they normally did. Pray for us, they say, to God, that we might be saved from the serpents. Moses prayed, and God said, set a serpent on a pole. Anyone who looks at that pole will be saved. I find it interesting that the people prayed or asked Moses. The people did not pray to God. Their sin cut them off from him. They had no right to even lift their eyes up to heaven for what they did against God. Were they to ask God for anything? And yet Moses prayed and approached God for them. But Moses, too, in the very previous chapter, had himself sinned. He could not take it anymore either. The people asked for water, and God sent it. But Moses hit the rock with a staff rather than speaking to the rock. Here is your water, you sinful rebels, he said. For Moses and the people, a snake was put on a pole. For failed leaders and faithless people, God said, look in faith and be saved. It was Jesus who himself referenced this story in John chapter 3 when he spoke to Nicodemus. As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son on a different pole, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God gave us Jesus. What we could not do, Jesus did. Yet in and through what Jesus did, we now have access and God hears our prayers. God was showing us that in our sin, we should not look to ourselves, but to Christ alone. Through him we are saved from the fiery bites of the serpent who turns our hearts from God. Through Christ and his cross, we are saved. And so we get to the gospel for today. They were in the upper room when Jesus spoke these tender words to them. Jesus had just given them his body and blood. 
He was about to suffer and die on the cross and give his life for them. The command to pray was not a command in the sense of an obligation, but a promise of encouragement for them to ask. It was a command like, eat your ice cream, or you can have a cookie after supper, just ask. Ask is a gospel command of promise, not, uh, not a sort of obligation to hold over their heads. With prayer, we have an open line with God our Father. On account of Jesus, God hears us and answers our requests. For they were disciples of Jesus. They had been with the Lord. God would hear them on that account. And you have been with the Lord too. You have been baptized into him. And he loves you, for you have loved Jesus. The disciples were not like serpents in the house of a king, what might be called royal slaves. To be a royal slave is to work in a good house where life is good, but the king shares nothing with you. You just need to do your work. Instead, we are, like in the ancient world, friends of the king, a sort of department secretaries, cabinet members, secretaries, are consulted on policy information. We know the will of the king. He has set his agenda before us, and we have a say in what is decided and done. You do not only work for the king, you share in his rule on earth. You know what he is doing, and you know why. You join him in his daily work in this world. You interact with the will of God, and you counsel him how to implement his policy in your life and in the lives of others. We, being informed of what God wishes to do, being taught of his will in the word, being given his platform, are his secret envoys. We inform God of the things that need to get done as we see them as they need to be done here on earth. And so James says in the epistle, not to be only hearers of the word, but doers also. Prayer is doing the word. When we fail to pray, we are, as James said, like those who look in the mirror, but upon leaving, forget what we look like and who we are. Prayer is remembering who you are. Remember who you are. Look in the mirror today, the mirror of God's word. Who are you? You are seated like the disciples around the Last Supper table. You are forgiven by the Lord, loved by him, accepted, redeemed, washed, justified, and sanctified by your Savior. You are his royal servants. And so, rogate, remember that this week. Pray ye, ask. Don't pray because you have to. Pray because he loves you and because he will hear your cries and will give you all you need. Pray because God is good, because he has loved you, and because he has given you his Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.